my beginnings. My beginnings, well, I probably should begin by saying where I came from originally. I was born in Bratislava, Czechoslovakia, which is now Slovakia. When my parents were born, it was part of Hungary and called Pressburg. My grandparents on my mother's side were called Coleman and Fratiska. They had seven children, four boys and three girls. Three of the boys were in concentration camp, but luckily survived. The fourth son spent the war years in England, where he was in the Czech army. After the war, two brothers went to Israel, one with his wife and a small son. They, they then had a, a daughter in Israel. The other went on his own, while the other two brothers stayed in the Czech Republic. One had four daughters. Both my aunts and mother were in concentration camps. All were sent to Auschwitz. My mother and her sister Lily died there. Rogie, who is the mother of John Sulan, came to Australia with John and her husband Court. My grandparents on my father's side were called Charlotte and Emmanuel. They had four sons. Two sons called, one called Lutzi, later known as Leslie, and his wife's wife and son and daughter got to England in 1939. Also an uncle called Alfred, known as Freddie, and he and his wife came about the same time. My father was Alexander, known as Shani, and his younger brother Andor, known as Andy. Both died in concentration camps, Andy and Auschwitz. My parents grew up in Bratislava, and I believe knew each other as they grew up. My father was a civil engineer and held a very good position on the railways. I think he was a manager. Because of his position and the respect he was held in, they thought they would not have any problems. Unfortunately, this was not the case, and they realized too late despite having relevant documents pertaining to their good behavior and character and health, which were required, the borders were, were shut and no one could get out. My mother was known as Frederica, nicknamed Fritzi, but on all legal documents was called Badrishka. She was a school teacher. I do not know when my parents or paternal grandparents went into hiding, just that we were all together. Amazingly, I have many papers and documents belonging to my parents, even their passports. I was born 30th of January, 1944. At some stage, my grandfather went out and was never seen again. We presume he got picked up and transported. My parents were taken away sometime, I think, in September, 44, working it out from some documents I got from an American Holocaust Museum, which with the help from my stepsister, we managed to acquire. They were both taken to Auschwitz. From a letter one of my uncles in England received by someone who had been in Auschwitz, who saw my father twice, was told by my father that he and my mother had been brought in together. Unfortunately, there have been no records found when my mother died. My father was transported from our switch to Dachau on the 27th of October, 1944. He later died there on the 18th of January, 1945. He became very sick, as many did from many diseases. I was taken shortly after my parents with my grandmother, I believe in the October, to Bergen-Belsen. How she kept me alive is a mystery and a miracle. I have been told that they killed small babies on arrival, so somehow she must have hidden me. I owe my life and survival to a very brave, courageous and special lady, my grandmother. She died, unfortunately, on the 5th of May, 1945, just after the Allies and British Red Cross came to the camp. I was found in my grandmother's dying arms by a Polish woman who happened to be passing the hut we were in and heard me crying. We were taken to the field hospital that had been set up. My grandmother died a day later. I like to believe that she died knowing she had saved me. While I was in the hospital, a Polish woman, whom my grandmother had befriended, kept coming to see how I was getting on. 
a Red Cross nurse called Enid Fernandez noticed her and through an interpreter asked who I was. Enid always carried a pad around with her to write down all the stories she heard. Well, the Polish woman told her my name and the names of my uncles who had gone to England and all about the family that my grandmother had told her about. Enid, thinking she had heard this story before, checked her pad and found the same story that she had heard from a Czech Air Force man. He did not know what had happened to me, but he gave her the address of one of my uncles. She immediately, through the Red Cross, contacted him. He responded by saying I should be sent to them. In the meantime, I was sent on a convoy to Sweden. While I have Enid Fernandez fresh in my mind, I will jump ahead a bit to when I was about 12 years old. Enid kept in contact with my step-parents over the years and came for a visit. She couldn't stop staring at me because when she last saw me, I was very undersized both and was both physically and mentally extremely underdeveloped. They thought I was quite retarded and maybe had, amongst other things, rickets and here was a normal 12-year-old. I was sent to my Uncle Freddie and Auntie Rene, who had now two daughters, with only 16 months between them. I came in age smack bang in the middle. I believe at this time both uncles and families were living in the same house, as Leslie was waiting to go into his own. Unfortunately, I was quite a handful. Still many emotional problems in communications, etc. So very hard to manage. It was decided I should not live with Rene and Freddie, but with my uncle Leslie and Auntie Ditty. Their children were a lot older. Stepsister about 11 years old and brother about eight to nine years old. I was duly adopted when I was five years old. Not that I remember any of that, but funny enough, I do remember going to the council chambers in a place called Kingston, which had a red carpet, and I stood with my step-parents behind a barrier, not realising I was being legally adopted. I think I thought we were, go we were on an outing. Growing up, I spent a lot of time with my other cousins, often staying overnight. We were very close, and I'm glad to say still are today. When I was about 10 years old, I was told I was adopted which came as a big shock. I was given a silver locket with pictures of my natural parents in it. I think I was told how they died, but not a lot then. I was not told I was Jewish, as my stepfather had po pushed his Jewishness aside, in fear, I think. In fact, to the day he died, he had no connection with anything Jewish. The weird thing was, though, the friends he had from Czechoslovakia, I realised later, were all Jewish. Whether they practised, I don't know. The first Seder I went to was at my Uncle Freddy's and Auntie Rene's house. I remember sitting in amazement when both my step-parents read in Hebrew. When my sister got married, I was about 14 years old. She had two ceremonies, one in church and one in a register office. I knew by now I was Jewish, but did not understand then why my, my uncle Freddy refused to go to the church. I left school at age 15 and a half and did an apprenticeship in hairdressing. When I finished my apprenticeship at about 20 years, and as my aunt Roji, who for years kept asking me to come to Australia, I decided to go. One of the reasons was I, that I hoped to learn more about my mother. The only snag was leaving my then boyfriend, Ray. But we both decided we were both young, that I would go for two years then and come back eventually. But I got married instead. <laughs> In the meantime, as I say, I met my ex-husband. I was very lonely and missed everyone, so for all the wrong reasons, got married. But I have to say, two very good things came out of this. My gorgeous sons, Misha and Andrew. Misha, my eldest son, lives in Melbourne with his, his wife, Kim, and now have a beautiful baby girl named Hannah, born in May. Andrew, my other son, lives in Adelaide, where he is a high school teacher, which he really enjoys.
On the subject of men and my life, I should mention Gilbert, my long-time partner, who has always been a tower of strength and extremely supportive over the years. 2004, Gilbert and I went to England and Czech Republic and Slovakia to try to locate where my parents and grandparents lived in Slovakia. My sister came with us. My Czech cousin Helena acted as interpreter. We found where my parents lived and the school my mother taught in, but drew a blank where our grandparents lived. Part of the problem being, many of the names of, of streets were changed during the communist occupation, and many people suddenly had mental blanks about the events and residents of people in the war. As one old time approved who said he had lived there all his life and never heard of Jewish people ever living there, even though there used to be a synagogue not far away. Last year I had an amazing phone call from Mad Rabbi Kaminsky, who had received an email from a lady in London whose mother had looked after me in Sweden. The lady's name is Tamar. I immediately emailed back with my address and phone number. Tamar phoned the next day and asked me to phone her mother in Israel, which I did. Tamar's mother, Esther, had written a book about the children she had cared for while she was in child care establishments. I was the only one she looked after in her home. The book was written in Hebrew, so Tamar translated it into English and her son checked it over. While he was doing it, he noticed that his grandmother always expressed a wish to know what had happened to me. So he said, why not Google my name? And my name came up with the Adelaide Jewish Museum article I had done some years before. Here is Esther's part and how we came into each other's lives. Esther and her husband, Ziv Shalman, were on their honeymoon when he got a call to return to work as a boatload of people had arrived from the concentration camps. And his job was to help place these people in suitable accommodation and assist them in any way he could. While he was going through the hospital, he spotted me. I was a misfit, being so young, about 16 months, the size of a three month, so both physically and mentally extremely below my age and considered retarded. They wanted to put me in a home for retarded children. Zeeb did not think this was appropriate and phoned Esther, who agreed to take me. He took me to their home. When I arrived, I apparently went straight under the table where I stayed till I eventually trusted them. Esther did wonders for me. I was approximately six months, by which time I was still immature for my age, but able to function nearer my age. When I was taken from her to go to England, she was not given any forwarded addresses. Esther and Ziv have two children in Sweden and then emigrated to Israel, where she had two more. Last year, I went to Israel and stayed with one of my cousins called Naomi in Tel Aviv. And while there, went with my other cousin, her brother Mika, to see Esther, who now lives in a retirement village near Bisheba. We had a wonderful reunion, very emotional, but oh so rewarding. While I was in Israel, my Czech cousin Helena came over, so for the first time, four cousins who had never ever been all together met. And basically that, thank you very much, is my story. And I thank you very, very much indeed for listening to me. Thank you. Yeah.